welcome back to another episode of Storied Stories. First, before I get started into this too hard, um, I want to apologize for last week's video. The audio kept cutting out because I was talking way too softly and had my mic way too far away, or my face way too far away from the mic, so I cut out a lot. I'm going to work on being a little more um, vocal, a little louder, so the mic picks me up a little better than it did the weeks prior. Um, oh. And I'm knocking over my 30 millimeter shell, which is not helping. I'm going to go ahead and turn that up too. So hopefully that helps out. Um, but like I said, I want to be more conscious about keeping my face near the microphone. So it picks you picks me up better. And then uh, if it doesn't, I'll be less lazy and actually edit in the audio from the other videos. So you guys can actually hear me instead of having cut out constantly. But... Now, we're going to go ahead and talk about what we're going to do in this video. This video, we're going to pick up where we left off in the article about the four horsemen, the C-130 demonstration team when the C-130 was first making its rounds in the military. Uh, we didn't get too deep into the article, so we're going to try to get a little deeper into it. And this week, we're going to go ahead and try to install all these parts that are right here. We're almost done with assembly, um, so the next step will be painting. Uh, then after that, we're going to work... Uh, if we can get these done in a decent amount of time, we got the cargo floors to go ahead and install. As you can see, I still haven't put the windshield into the cockpit yet. And it's actually still right, <coughs> excuse me, right here. And I'm actually super nervous about, uh, hold on, let me get my, there we go. This piece right here. It's, um, it's a very small, tiny, clear piece that I'm sure I'm going to end up losing, uh, and, or breaking or both. So I'm going to wait for that to later because they go on to these pieces right here. Uh, so I'm a little nervous about that. Hopefully it won't be an issue at all. But before we get into assembly, let's go ahead and start reading a little bit more about the Four Horsemen. Get some more articles in here. Uh, where we left off was talk about the different maneuvers these planes pulled uh, when the Four Horsemen flew them. Um, now we're going to be actually talk about how the four horsemen had their aircraft assigned. Like with the Thunderbirds and Blue Angels, for those of you who are not familiar with demonstration teams, they have specific aircraft assigned to them at all times. Like the, the crews will always change out, but the planes will always remain the same. But that wasn't the case with the C-130 uh, demonstration team with the four horsemen. The article on History Net continues on saying, but... That uh, no particular aircraft were assigned to the four horsemen. Each crew drew whatever plane happened to be available on the flight line at the end at Ardmore or at Sweet Sweetwort after the 463rd moved there to join the 314th shortly after the latter wing converted to the Hercules. The two wings made up the muscle of the tax 839th Air Division which was also believe, or also based at Seward. I don't know if that's supposed to be Stewart, but it's S-E-W-A-R-T. I'm going to have to look that up sometime, but it says Seward. The, the demonstration pilots flew the same training and operational missions as their other pilots in the C two C-130 wings. Very early on, the C-130 demonstration demonstrated its ability to fly on three and even two engines without a significant loss of performance. In fact, a Lockheed test crew took off from Florida, shut down the aircraft's outboard engines, and flew all the way to California at low level on two engines. The airplane was so overpowered that crews routinely shut down the outboard engines on some flights to conserve fuel. And see, how many uh, large planes do you know can do that? I mean, I'm not an aviation expert. There's probably several out there that could do that, but the fact that the C-130 is able to shut out its outboard engines and still fly from Florida to California without any problems at all. I mean, granted, it had to be at low level, but that's still really impressive. So just like another testament to the incredibility of this aircraft and the performance. Um, I, I already, and I'm sorry to kind of change gears, but I've already um, inspected the plane to see if I need to do another coat or primer. It doesn't look like I'll need to. It looks fairly well coated. So what we're going to go ahead and do as I move the mic to make sure when I move, you guys can still hear me, is we're going to go ahead and install the fuel ferry tanks. Um, these are tanks just to carry additional fuel for the aircraft. So when it goes on long missions, they don't have to worry about refueling as often. And it's limited. Um, or not limited. It gives it greater range. And especially since the AC-130 can 
cut off its outboard engines, it makes it easier for it to do that. I may actually go ahead and take off my ring. I don't want to get paint or glue on it, so I'm going to set it off to the side. Plus, my finger needs to air out a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and get on to that. We're going to try to move pretty quickly through this video today. Um, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to reduce the, the time on the videos because I talk too much and I get too focused on these parts. This is, I'm pretty much eating the mic right now <laughs> to make sure uh, my voice doesn't cut out at all while I'm talking to you guys. But the moments I am silent, it's because I'm focusing on what I'm doing. I'm trying to perfect being more precise in my gluing slash painting. Right now, I'm just gluing. You know what I just realized? There's supposed to be four fairy tanks. And I've only added the two. Right? Probably getting a little ambitious and doing this way too soon. Ooh, I don't like that at all. Okay, so we're going to have to glue along here because those pegs are not going to be sufficient to hold this tank into place. And then after we glue these on while they dry, I'm going to look through the instruction manual to make sure I'm not missing something because there is definitely holes for additional fairy tanks. And I can't remember how many fairy tanks to see. I think the C-130 does carry... The glue takes the paint right off. We'll survive. I mean, it's supposed to be strong stuff, so... Okay, so a little... And a little pressure not to break the wings. Alright, while that one sets... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and see where, if there's supposed to be other, I mean, because there is another set of fairy tanks in there. Worst case scenario, I can always add them later. Um, the C-130 does not have fairy tanks in permanently installed on it. They're supposed to be meant to be taken on and off, because if they're only doing a short range mission, they won't need to carry as many. Uh, no? Okay, it doesn't say anything about additional fairy tanks, so... We're just going to go, they just call them external field tanks, um, but they're also called fairy tanks. Where the heck did the other one, oh, it's right there. Uh, but they, they're not meant to be permanently on, they're only meant for like extended missions, and if they're hauling a lot of cargo a short distance and they want to reduce the amount of weight that the C-130 has on it, they don't put the fairy tanks on it, because if they hit... The C-130 has enough fuel to carry it as is. There's no reason to add more weight to the aircraft. Just to have a little more fuel, especially. And. On. We mess this up somehow. I won't be surprised if that's the case. Don't. Like this, I don't know how we're gonna get this to glue on. Maybe I'm gonna be over generous with the glue. Oops, on the wing and the fairy tank. Are so shaky. Okay, there we go. That, that snapping in wasn't the part actually sitting in properly. That snapping in was me not getting the peg into the hole like it was supposed to. And it uh, kind of snapped right into place. But while those go ahead and dry, I'm going to see what's next to do on the model kit. Uh, looks like we're going to be doing the doors, the landing lights to the doors. I'm a little nervous about this part too. That's those small plastic clear pieces. Um... Admittedly, I sh you know what? I may not do those today. I might wait and pick up some like yellow paint or something to kind of give it the illusion of being a landing light. Um, I don't know how well it worked. I've never done something like this before, so it could be uh, take a little more than that. But who knows? We'll 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 attack cross that bridge when it come to it. Um, but while that dries, we'll go ahead and keep reading about the four horsemen and their C-130 demonstration team and see how that goes from there. I'm just going to turn up my mic sensitivity just a little bit so I it does not... Oh, wow. Okay. So I don't have to be as concerned about 
it cutting out while I'm talking. Sorry for those guys that might have been listening to headphones and just heard the headset just kind of blow their ears. At, so I apologize about that. Um, but we'll go ahead and continue. It says very, very early on the C-130 demonstration demonstrated its ability to fly on three or even two inches. With, oh no! Nope, during the four horsemen, yeah, during one of one four horsemen performance. Cheney, who normally flew in number three position but was taking the lead that day, lost an outboard engine. He and his crew went through the engine shutdown procedures without losing their place in formation, then simply went on with the show. Let's see, the Thunderbirds or Blue Angel trying that one. Now, that's kind of an unfair statement, uh, at least with the Thunderbirds. It's a single engine aircraft and the blue angels are dual engine aircraft they're both jets um and also they only have one member in the crew it's the pilot c-130 has several members in the crew the load master the co-pilot the navigator all that and the flight engineer so that gives them the ability to do that without having to sweat about it the pilot can keep flying while the rest of the crew doesn't work but you know i get the point they're trying to get across is that this plane can continue demonstration despite having um engine issues to a point anyway i mean obviously there's a point where uh they got to be careful because an engine being down is dangerous regardless of the capabilities of the aircraft because anything can go wrong and if they don't and they may need that extra engine to pull out of it so um continue on the article while those parts dry the most difficult position to fly in the formation was number three because the aircraft commander was on the opposite side of the airplane from the rest of the formation and had to constantly be turning his head to the right as the chief of the horseman Cheney usually occupied that spot while Moore usually flew the lead the co-pilot in the right seat helped his boss maintain the tight formation that had become the team's trademark all the pilots were highly qualified veterans with an average of 4,000 hours of total flying time and 1,500 hours in C-130s by late 1959 when the Aviation Week journalists rode with them, co-pilots were drawn from the ranks of aircraft commanders in the squadron, and that quite often those men were instructor pilots as well. When the 774th was deployed, the four horsemen went right along with their squadron mates, airlifting men and equipment to Lebanon in one the instances, in one instance, and to Formosa in another. They practiced their horseman routine whenever they could, but that was often less than 10 hours a month. The pilots maintained their proficiency the same way other troop carrier pilots did, flying training missions that included close formation flying, though not as close as the horsemen generally flew in a performance. The men themselves wore no distinctive uniforms other than a small patch on their flight suit with a horse's head and a Roman numeral 4. They also wore, wore scarves to dress up a bit for the shows. The C-130 ordinarily called for a five-man crew, but the horsemen flew with only four, two pilots, a flight engineer, and a scanner. The navigator's seat was sat empty during the shows. The screws came. The screws. The crews came from within their squadron, and the horsemen pilots tried to fly with the same flight mechanics when possible. There was great esprit de corps among the flight mechanics who de debated which pilot was best, which position was more difficult to fly, and so on. In the air, the mechanics soon learned the torque settings needed at a particular point in a maneuver, the pro proper time for call-outs instrument reading, of instrument readings, the scanners from the maintenance and for, I'm sorry, the scanners came from maintenance and were just as proud to be part of the four horsemen as the pilots and flight mechanics. Hatfield remembered that the scanners ordinarily did not fly during performances, but were there to help to get the plane off the ground. So, like I said, the, it's kind of unfair to make that comment about the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels, considering that the uh, C-130 normally has more than a crew of four, but in this case they only had four because I'm sure, I'm sure it's for safety reasons because they don't need a bunch of guys being tossed about inside the cabin of the aircraft while they're performing maneuvers especially um was considering like normally i don't know back then if they had dedicated load masters that often um they weren't hauling cargo so they really didn't need load masters to be in the aircraft with them while they were flying so if they had too many people in there that would 
cause a safety concern. So that's probably why they had a limited number. But the point being still that the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds only had one person per aircraft in the air. I mean, they had a whole that de- both teams have dedicated members and crew that were on the ground for spotting and maintenance and PR and all that other and logistics and all that other good stuff. But they, they couldn't really help the pilots in the air when, if they came across any mechanical issues. So like restarting an engine, if an engine failed was not really an option for them. Okay. So again, this might be stupid to glue these doors in now without the landing lights. Um, I'm sorry. I'm trying to move this out of the way. Uh, with the landing li- without the landing lights on, but I do want to go ahead and start putting. The, looks like the wheels, the tires. Well, I mean the wheels and tires are one piece. And the tires, the struts, and the doors are going on next. So we're gonna go ahead and start assembling the tires onto their struts. Let's make sure we got them positioned properly. The so that part faces down. Okay. So what? I don't know how well you guys are gonna be able to see this, but right here. There's a little lumpy area. You can't really see it that well. Let's go to the GoPro. Maybe you can see it there. Right there, there's a little lumpy area, and that's going to be the part that's facing down. Now, I'm a little concerned about this because the pegs are not going to sit in there that well. Oh, this is going to be difficult all around. I'm trying to get that in, in, these tiny pieces into that area. So I'll go ahead and get it in the tweezers. I'm just going to see... Oh, that wasn't too bad. Okay. I mean, I, I, I was still at the glue. But we're... Yeah, I was going to put the tires on these first and then put the struts into place. But it actually might be better off that I put the struts into place and then put the tires on. I just screwed on the glue. Whoops. All right. I'm getting nervous super nervous okay so we're gonna go ahead and glue the inside so if I go quiet it's because I'm focusing okay inside is glued and to glue the back side of the strut Back sides glued. Add a little more glue on there. Okay. Put that back in here. Do my best to get this part into place without messing anything up too badly. See, of course, it pops in just fine when there's no glue on. Now there's glue on. I can't get it in there. And that's just my luck. Well, let's just glue it in crooked, right? Okay, come on. Nope. Okay, that's what I was afraid of. I got it in perfectly with no glue. Now that I have glue, it doesn't want to go in at all. Okay, let me focus. All right, this isn't going well at all. I um, don't know what the deal is. I got the part to pop in real easy without the glue and now like I said that I got glue on this stupid thing it does not want to cooperate at all and I'm stripping all that paint off I'm about to actually stop the recording real quick so I can figure this out so you guys aren't just sitting and listening to quiet as I struggle and possibly start throwing up a cussing storm all right looks like we got it question is is there enough glue on there to hold it into place and I'm going to take this tank off because I'm going to have to glue that back on, unfortunately. So we're going to go ahead and start doing the next piece. <clears throat> Luckily, I got game footage rolling so you guys can kind of have some background noise while I'm doing this. All right, we got those struts in place. Uh, I guess we're just going to 
hope that they'll hold. Now to re glue fairy tank back on. I'm thinking that there's a reason why I, they didn't want me priming before I glue this on because I don't think it's seating very well. To the glued surface. So I think I might end up having to sand those areas and then respray prime this later. We'll see. Back on. Okay. But I mean, this is my first model kit. I guess I gotta learn somehow. Um, we're going to go ahead and try to do the other part and then I'll use the reading as a, my de-stressing moment as I continue on with the article. Um, I do not have the steadiest of hands. That is not helping me at all. They shake a lot. Why is my, how did that get bent? Weezers are bent. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I really don't want to do this difficult but that'll be done I guess my hands are like super shaky right now and I'm like insanely hot like 80 something degrees outside and I have my AC off for two reasons one my wife is sleeping and she gets cold super easily and two because last time I did that, you guys constantly heard the AC running in the background, which I'm sure was real pleasant to listen to, especially in my quiet moments. All right, so I got the struts in place now, so that's good with minimum damage and stressed. Um, really worried about those fuel tanks. I don't know how that's going to stay in so well. But um, I'm going to let those struts dry in place, and then we'll worry about putting the tires on after. We're going to go ahead and continue um, reading this article. I'm going to move this out of the way so I can make sure. Um, uh, where we left off was talking about the uh, flight mechanics that they, they help the aircraft getting off the ground and all that good stuff. So we're going to continue from there. The four veteran aircraft commanders of the Horseman team had, to be, had been with the C-130 since the first assigned to the 4th 63rd at... Ardmore in December of 1956. Cheney, along with the with Captain Richard Stumpy Coleman, had picked up the first airplane to be delivered at the factory in Marietta, Georgia, and flown it to Admore a year after the first Hercules arrived at Admore. The 463rd left Oklahoma, and when they based closed, moving the excuse me, moving to Tennessee to join the 314th. The horsemen continued to stage their performance from their new base. By early 1960, the C-130 had been in service with the Air Force for more than two years. Lockheed had developed a new model of the Hercules, the C-130B, and the 463rd and 3 14th began converting to the new version as the older A models transferred overseas to overseas squadrons. As the oldest C-130 pilots in the Air Force, in terms of time in the airplane, the four horsemen were ripe for deployment overseas. In a recent interview, Hatfield speculated that they could have probably have remained at Stewart, or Seward, I'm sorry, and continued the team if someone had pushed it for it, but it didn't happen that way. Three of the four received overseas orders, while the fourth, more left the service and returned to Texas. Cheney got orders to Weisbanden, West Germany. Aiken went to Chachi Tachikawa, Japan, and Hatfield ended up a few miles away in Yokota. By the way, guys, Yokota, that, if you guys remember from early episodes of Story Sorties, Yokota is my first duty assignment in the Air Force, was Yokota Air Force Base, Japan, which still remains to be a C-130 Hercules base and if I remember correctly correctly they got C-130Js and C-130Hs now and it sounds like about the time that Hatfield went over there he was in the C-130As too still because 
it sounds like the overseas bases got A's and the overseas the stateside bases got B's. Um, and then Tachikawa, I never personally went there, but I I've heard of it and I've been around there before. Um, Yokota right now is being converted to a joint base with JazzDev in the U.S. military. Uh, at least it was uh, about the same time the the typh- the tsunami hit Japan and the reactors went off. Um, but yeah, that's that's bringing back some old memories and kind of re bringing back full circle to my stories about my beginnings of the Air Force. Um, and in fact, maybe next episode when we get into more painting, I'll so I can kind of talk and paint and maybe not have to focus as hard. I'll still have to focus a little bit. There are some detailing to do on here, but I can talk a little bit more about my time at Yokota and what I did while I was out there. Um, but the story goes on and says Cheney and more Cheney and more died several years later. Oh, I'm sorry. Except for more, they would have all remained in contact with one another for over the years. Cheney and Moore died several years ago. Hatfield and Aiken still remained in touch today. Although the career of the four horsemen came to an end in spring of 1960, they left behind a remarkable legacy. In honor of the team, the official patch of the 774th Troop Carrier Squadron was modified to include Red Lightning Bolt, reminiscent of the team's effect on the squadron. All right, so that's a good spot to stop for now. I'm going ahead and brave putting these stupid tires on. I'm not sure how this is going to work because the pegs don't really serve a purpose. So um, they definitely don't snap in. We're going to have to start with this side of the aircraft. Because that's the side I put the struts on first. Um, and just kind of in case this happens again, what I'm going to end up doing, the moments where I go really quiet trying to glue these pieces together, I'm going to go ahead and just edit them out and um that way the video is not a long moments of silence as i try to focus putting these pieces together put glue inside the peg hole all around the wheel and then get some glue try not to get the glue on the tire to strip the paint off the tire get some glue around here and then i'm very carefully all right, I'm going to push the mic out of the way again so I can focus on putting the tire on. So give me a second. Well, that wasn't as bad, <laughs> considering that there's not a whole lot of finagling I need to do. There's a really tiny piece I'm going to need to put on later that I'm really, really nervous about. Um, it's going to go in the front landing gear, and it's very... Very small. So we're going to repeat the process here. Put some glue on there. All right, again, pushing the mic out of the way, so excuse the silence. Well, that's two wheels and tires down. I bet the maintainers that work on these planes wish it was this easy to install wheels and tires. I mean, it's not... Other than the fact that they have to put the uh, plane on jack stands. They're literally... They're, they're really impressive pieces of equipment. They look like giant jack stands you would use for your car. And they attach to certain points of the aircraft near the tail and the wings. To keep the aircraft off the ground so they can do maintenance on the landing gear. Whether it's to replace wheels and tires or replace the landing gear assembly as a whole. Uh, I have a bad feeling one of these are going to end up falling out later. And I'm going to have to try to re-glue it with the wheels and tires on. About to put the final main landing gear wheel and tire on. Crap, I'm getting cocky now because. There we go. There we go. And then out of the way. Okay. 
You just got to trust the glue will do its job and hold that in place. The next will be putting the landing gear doors on, but we'll go ahead and continue the article. Give the wheels and tires a moment to secure to their new struts. Um, honestly, I'm trying to decide why I even bother painting all this because the doors are going to be covering the wheels and tires anyway. But anyway, we'll go ahead and continue with the article. During the remainder of their careers, the four, four pilots remained associated with the C-130s, as did many others who had flown with the team as backup aircraft commanders and co-pilots. Hatfield went on to pilot the reconnaissance version of the C-130B with a super secret, 60, <laughs> super secret, 6091st six, reconnaissance squadron at Yukota Air Base. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that the whole time I was there. That never came up. Um, then returned to the United States to join the Lockheed C-141 program at Charleston Air Force Base in South Carolina. C-141, that retired the year I joined. That was the Strato Fortress. You had the Global the global, global Master and the Galaxy are the other cargo planes. The C-17 Global Master and the C-5 Galaxy. And this is the C-1... Uh, 41, not Strata Fortress. Crap. I want to look it up. I can't remember. But that, yeah, that retired the year I joined. He subsequently was placed in command of the rescue squadron equipped with HC-130Hs in California. Cheney returned to the 463rd after the remit wing moved from Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. Another base. Hey, look at that. I followed the pass of the four horsemen to a point. Uh, one was in Yukota Air Base. Another one ended up at Langley Air Force Base. Um, both bases of which I was stationed at. The Langley did not have C-130s when I was there. They just had F-15s, F-22s, and F-16s. Um, and I think T-38s ended up showing up there at some point. I know one of the trainers did. I think it was the T-38. Um where it had gone from Seward in 1963 to Clark Field in the Philippines. Now, my unit I was with at Yokota was originally at Clark Field in the Philippines, and from what I understand from my tech school instructor, who was a retired Air Force, who was stationed in Clark Field, um, had to be relocated to Yokota after like a volcano erupted and uh, destroyed pretty much the base from my understanding. Uh, Billy Mills, a veteran 774th pilot who often flew th with the Four Horsemen, also served with the 463rd at Clark on May 12, 1968. Mills was one of the of a handful of C-130 pilots who braved devastating enemy fire to rescue Allied troops surrounded by a larger enemy force at a Special Forces camp at Kum Kum Duck, South Vietnam. It's K A A K H A M D U C. Today, the memory of the four horsemen lives on in the the once the, the 16 millimeter film Lockheed produced to make the 15 minute movie a motion picture company hired by Lockheed shot thousands of feet of thousand feet of film oh because of the film reels of the quarter the quartet in action the horsemen themselves were not especially happy with the finished product once the, it was edited down. The voices of actors were dubbed into the film, including one with a nasal <laughs> northern voice. Hey, what's wrong with northern? The nasal part is annoying. Who claimed to be the chief of the four horsemen. In reality, all horsemen were southerners. Cheney and Moore from Texas. Aiken from Tennessee and Hatfield from Mississippi. That's probably why they didn't want a northerner voice in them. I take offense to that. Uh, we only got two paragraphs left of this article. So we're going to finish that. We're going to get on to gluing and talk about personal stories to fill in the time as I remain putting these pieces on. We're about 40 minutes into filming, probably less than that after I edit out those long moments of silence while I was fighting the struts. And then we'll probably call it after that with the video once I get all these small pieces glued in, which I'm super not excited about. So, the four horsemen have been out of business for more than 40 years now, but the men who came up with the way to showcase the Hercules' excellent performance and their remarkable aerial demonstrations are not forgotten, thanks largely to one short film and the listing, lasting memories they gave everyone who witnessed firsthand the precision maneuvers in transport aircraft. For more great articles, subscribe to Aviation History Magazine today. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to give them that little plug, but it's okay. Um... 
but yeah, that just shows you like the even something as big and clunky as the C one thirty has a heritage in military history. Um and quite the story to it. I mean I guarantee there's a lot more stories. Um there's a a couple award winner medal winners in the Air Force history that we had to study that were crew members on C one thirties that I could probably talk about in future videos. Uh, I may not, because like I said, we're getting to the end of the assembly of this aircraft, and it's going to be mainly painting. I don't know how much of that I'm going to be able to film, but what I do film, I might just talk about myself and my career at Yokota Air Base, my dealings with the C-130. Next, we're going to be putting on the landing doors, which looks like it's going to be so much fun. I'm super excited about doing. So let's go ahead and just like treat this like a Band-Aid and give it o get it over with. Uh, these doors look universal, so we can pop these on any way I like, I guess. And if I can't get these clear landing lights on after the doors have been installed, oh well, I'm going to live. I don't think anybody's ever going to notice that they're not there. Except for you guys, because I just told you they may not be there. Okay, so we're getting glue on this door. At least we're getting to little bigger pieces without dedicated spots to put these on. You can just slide them in and hope for the best. Kind of, sort of. That's probably the worst way to do my old kit building, but hey, I'm trying, all right? I'm a newbie. Be gentle with me. It's my first time. Yeah, okay, I can already see it's going to be a pain about to put the landing light on. I'll figure it out, I guess. Go ahead and slide the... No! Why have you forsaken me? There we go. No. Okay, hopefully he did well enough to be glued into place. So this is what we got going on so far. Focused. Focus. Where did my tweezers go so I can now point this out? I have the landing gear all right there. And the door. See? GoPro world. Landing gear and door. Now we're going to do the other side. And I, this, gluing pieces on is like my least favorite part. Okay, gluing small pieces on is my least favorite part. Because I know I'm probably doing something wrong. Oops. And I'm glad I painted these ahead of time. But I'll, I'm be upset if that's what's making it hard for this thing to seat on to its surfaces. Is because I have paint on the parts already. Inside like this. Be very careful not to disturb the wheels and tires. Alright. Both doors, outer doors are on. Now I got inner doors I need to try to put on there. Um, where's my tweezers again? Okay, uh, I think that's as best as I can get without breaking anything. Alright, so there's little pieces I need to shave off these because I didn't quite cut them down to their stubs. So I'm going to move the mic out of the way so I can get close to this real quick. Alright, well that didn't go absolutely horrible. I accidentally clipped off one that I needed to. But I guess I'll survive. It's acting like it's got slots there for me to slide this into. Very cute. Alright, uh, I guess. Uh oh. Guess what, boys and girls? That's it for the webcam or GoPro footage because the GoPro just died. Go ahead and lock up my phone. I think I'm getting mad at the GoPro like it's its fault. I knew it only had like 60% battery left and that I usually need to keep it plugged in while I record but I didn't do that because my charger is in my wife's room or in the room where my wife is sleeping and I try to limit how often I go in there so I don't wake her up hopefully I'm not being too loud with recording because she's actually in her guest bedroom right now which is sh where she's been sleeping this week because I've been doing yard work and stuff and the garage and I did really 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 didn't want to wake her up while I was doing all that well I might have just lost my first piece um it's the uh inner door to the landing gear and I just launched it across 
my bedroom. Launched it across my recording room, so now I gotta hopefully not lose this one. I mean, I guess if I want to make it look even. I'm gonna try to look forward after I'm done recording this video and then install it off camera if I need to. Alright, I'm not gonna use tweezers. Use my fingers like a man. I'm just kidding. I'm impatient and super worried that I'm gonna launch another piece across the room. So I guess that's not really being a man, that's just me being overly cautious and pathetic or something. I don't know. Alright. Take two of my last inner door. Which is not sliding in there like I thought it would. You know what is sliding in there? Nothing. Hold on. Moving the cam mic out of the way again. All right. It's looking like I have messed up big time. Um, like I said, there's going to be a jump cut because I'm going to edit that part out. But it looks like I was supposed to put the inner doors in first and then the struts and tires. So there will be no inner doors for the landing gear because I can't get it in there. So, unless I can, no, I'm not going to do that. So, lesson learned once again, maybe assembling first before painting, in some cases, is the better idea. So, I guess we're going to go on to the main landing gear and brave the insanely tiny pieces that are going to be going on in there. We're going to be basically doing... Um that right there not I'm not excited about that we're gonna do the insanely tiny piece first which is probably not the good answer oh I thought I broke something I got scared all right um which is gonna go I am not looking forward to this mm, delicious into a groove that does not exist on my kit thank you Hold on a second, moving the mic out of the way so I can look in there better. Good news, the groove exists. It's just very tiny and impossible to see. This is not going to be pleasant. I think I got straight um, plot, uh, tweezers I can use. And I think I need to go ahead and pull those bad boys out because I don't think my angled ones are going to do the job. All right, moving the mic out of the way again to get ready for this. Well, I think that's the best I'm going to do because it doesn't snap into place and I just got to hope the glue does its job and holds it in place. Uh, I'm thinking... Yeah, we can glue the pieces onto the door next. So we'll go ahead and move this big bad boy out of the way. And hopefully I can forget about all my pains and struggles with what the, I had to go through to get that thing together. And then we're going to put the main landing gear door together. 
Um, it doesn't really specify which is the straight, the front or the back of this. So we're going to go ahead and see how these pieces are going to slide. What would be the best way to slide these pieces in? They got a, it's got a little notch in the way. Give that down. Uh, that's stupid. Okay. Probably about to break these pieces. So I think is intended for that little notch on the door. Slide. Nope. Never mind. Yes. No. Oh. All right. Time for another moment of silence as I try to focus the glue these tiny pieces onto this door. I don't know if you guys remember from last week, but this is my repaired piece. A piece that I broke and tried to attempt to glue together. It looks like it worked out pretty well so far. Well, we got those pieces on the door. Probably annoying pieces on the door. And pull up the plane again, and there goes my instruction manual. Give me one second. Okay, that seems fair enough. I got another very tiny piece. So I don't need this plane right now. Uh, which has happened? Crap. I just made my screen stuff disappear. Give me a second. All right, it's back. Sorry. All right, I got to do a lot of jump cuts in here. I know I can already see that happening now. Uh, give me one quick second. We're going to glue this tiny piece on to this landing strut for the main landing gear. Maybe. Goes that way. Yeah, okay, hold on a second. 
All right, so, well, this tiny strut is actually backwards from what the manual says I should do, mainly because they did not, the, the opening's not wide enough. So, that's it. That's what I just glued together. Those two tiny pieces, the angled piece and the piece will be nailed by the tweezers. But I'm going to go ahead and let those dry. And I think that might be it for today's video, because uh, since these pieces are so small, uh, I want to make sure they fully dry before I try to, especially with that very, there's a very, very tiny piece down in here that I want to dry completely before I try putting more pieces on. So for now, guys, thank you very much for joining this video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it went better than the last one. Sorry for the lack of GoPro footage. I did not hook my camera to uh, charge. So I uh, granted lately I've been using less and less of the GoPro footage anyway and more of the webcam footage. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, this is what we were able to accomplish today. We got the landing gear on and the doors kind of on and the ferry tanks. So I'm going to let everything dry and we'll go ahead and do the main landing gear next. And then th where we'll be doing the next episode, the cargo ramp and door. Uh, in fact, I'm probably going to go ahead and prime and paint those off camera. So you, uh, you guys don't have to worry about watching a lot of jump cuts. So I hope you guys enjoy. Look forward to see you guys in the next video. Uh, we can still get to do the props next. So that should be fun. I'll go ahead and paint and prime those too. So let me know what you guys think down below. And I will see you all in the next one.